We're really delighted to have uh, Professor Joanne Martin with us here today from uh, Stanford University. And uh, her faculty host while she's here on campus is uh, Janet Paul. And Janet's going to introduce her. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Joanne Martin. And Joanne is the Fred H. Merrill Professor of Organizational Behavior and by Courtesy Sociology. And as of January, you put a comma on the end, Emerita, which is just uh, gone. We hope to go soon to <laughs> happy retirement. Um, and uh, she has comes to us with a background of a PhD in social psychology from Harvard University, and also has honorary doctorates at Copenhagen Business School and Ray Ray University. Ray University. Ray. 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 Um, Either that or Ascar. No, oh, okay. 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 so we know it's a proper I think of it as free university. Yeah. So Many of you are familiar with the work. She's uh, almost synonymous with the term organizational culture and number of awards and works as well as uh, fascinating and long history of doing research and um, some activism as well in the area of uh, gender organizations. She has a number of awards. I couldn't begin to summarize them all, but just a couple of the most, um, probably most well-known awards. So she has won the Centennial Medal from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University for research-based contributions to society. This is a very major um, award. She also has won the Distinguished uh, Scholar Career Achievement Award in Identity Management for Organization and Management Theory, and the list goes on and on. Just a few other kind of comments. She is a fellow of probably more associations than many of us are members of, including the American Psychological Association, the American Psychological Society, and the Academy of Management. I also want to mention that in addition to all the intellectual work in the area of gender, she has throughout her career been a promoter of issues in real life for gender and for issues for women in organizations at Stanford and throughout the Know well for her mentoring, both intellectually and uh, professionally. Many of us here already know her We're from lots of different disciplines, and that's in part because her work has been well cited and is well known in many different disciplines, including beyond communication and management, in psychology, sociology, and, and women's studies. Very well cited. So, enough of me talking, let me uh, let you hear her. The title of her talk, as you see up here, is Cross-sector interlocks in the process of socially constructing gender. Why is gender inequality so hard to change? Thank you very much. And thank you all for taking the time to come today. I'm really looking forward to talking with you because you're a very different audience than I often get in a business school. You're much more interdisciplinary. And as you'll see, that really fits the talk that I'm giving today, which is the new research that I've just started on. Um, I've done gender research for a while, and what I wanted to do was to change my focus and start to talk about change, and to do so on the macro level. And since I was trained as a psychologist, you can see that this has been a bit of a reach, so I'm looking forward to your feedback. Um, my co-author in this paper is Olivia O'Neill, otherwise known as Mandy, who's now at the University of Georgia. Now, let's see if this works. Okay, I'd like to start by simply saying the obvious, but to underscore it. Gender inequality is persistent and pervasive. It's proven to be extraordinarily difficult to change. In spite of massive efforts of governments as well as organizations to promote equality between the genders, inequality persists everywhere. So in every society studied, uh, and here fr going from tribes to industrialized economies, Anthropologists and historians both have found gender inequalities with women's activities consistently being given lower status. Another way to say the same thing is to look at the UN reports, which are probably the best cross-national uh, attempt to collect data. And inequality is found in every single nation. Women have poorer health, less ed ed less education and less access to education, lower pay and lower status, to name just a few things. What's really fascinating to me is the fact that in the, in the countries 
with relatively more equality between men and women. For example, Scandinavia. You'd think they'd have the problem licked. And they do in many ways. There's less inequality in pay, less inequality in education. But in those very same countries, occupational sex segregation is higher than in any other countries in the world. So it seems that once you fix the inequality, you get the segregation, and that those two things are in a very interesting uh, relationship. There has been, uh, particularly in the organizational research on gender, um, a real imbalance. We know lots and lots about wh where gender inequality exists. Um, but only recently has, have people turned their attention to whether and how gender inequality can be reduced. In the US, the focus of that research is reducing it one organization at a time because under our current national leadership, the chance of getting much progress out of the federal government in this country is quite low, but it's not the case in other countries where most of the change effort is focused on by um, either federal governments or projects that cross sectors. Um, my questions are really fundamental, and I'm not going to be able to answer them in one study, so I'm just giving you a taste of the data from the first study, but I want to begin and end with the bigger questions so that we can also talk about where I'd like this to go and what you think about that. Why is gender inequality so resistant to change? Is it unlike other kinds of inequality? If so, how? And what does the process of change actually look like? And in that second question, I'm going to look like the psychologist I was trained to be, and I'm going to go way down on the micro level. Um, first of all, I need to briefly go through something which I imagine for two-thirds of you is old hat and the other third you're not really interested. So bear with me because we need to be able to talk about this. And the reason is that many people think about um, the idea of sex and change as either a surgical operation or an oxymoron because the idea is that so much of sex and gender is biologically determined. I'd like to challenge that and I, the best way to do it briefly is to quote somebody else's work. Um, and this is Padovich and Reskin's work. They define sex as a biological category associated with a person's chromosomes and expressed in genitals, reproductive organs, and hormones. We will refer this as the plumbing. And then gender, in contrast, is a social category associated with a complex set of social processes that create and sustain differences between men and women. Thus, gender is constructed rather than innate, and it's constructed not in a vacuum, but in a gender-based hierarchy that privileges men, thus raising the notion of power. So we've got sex, we've got gender, and there's social construction um, in both that we need to talk about, because the meaning of being a biological woman changes from society to society. Um, and it is the socially constructed aspects of sex and gender that are changeable and not biologically determined. So that's that. And here in this slide, what I've got is a contrast between the ways in which we thought about sex and gender in the early 60s and early 70s. And you contrast that over here to the contemporary version, which is much more emphasizing the social construction of these things so that there's many different ways of being masculine, and there's many different ways of being feminine, and that these vary by race, nationality, ethnicity, and class. They also vary across time, so that when Foucault does a study of sexuality over time, we can see the really very different ideas about what's appropriate and what's normal. So that in the bottom line is that rather than having embodied individuals, we're now talking about socially constructed ideas about sex and gender that vary across contexts. So you can see I haven't gone that far from my old culture research. I'm still studying culture, but I'm studying the gendered aspects of culture. Um, now, gender is crucially important for organizational theory, although you'd never know that to read ASQ. Organizations pressure men and women to enact gendered roles, and jobs themselves are gendered. Individuals, though, are, have free will, so they are able and will, and within and outside the context of work, to resist conformity pressures and to enact a variety of ways of being a man or a woman, depending on their individual mood as well as the demands of a situation. So individuals move across contexts 
And we each draw on a repertoire of sex and gender related behaviors. So we become this kind of woman in one situation and this kind of woman in another situation. Um, and what the question I'm going to focus on today is what does the process of socially constructing gender? I mean, that's always been a word. Everybody throws it around in the literature. And I wanted to know what it really meant on a day-to-day -day micro level as people talk together in classrooms and in playgrounds and when they go home to mom and when they go out with their romantic other. Um, so what are the relevant contexts when we talk about gender? Most of the gender research so far has studied one context at a time. And the most popular context to study is families. We also have a lot of research about gender as it's enacted in school rooms and classrooms. We have quite a bit, beginning with Rosa Beth Cantor and Joan Acker's work, um, of what, organization, what gender looks like in formal organizations. But looking at this in one sector at a time is really the wrong way to go because we know that, particularly in the area of work and family, these sectors are closely intertwined. So that what happens at work affects what your life is like when you go home that day. And what happens at home affects what, what you feel like when you go to work at 9 AM on Monday morning. So um, the way the early feminist work talked about this is the slogan, the personal is political. So that any time you talked about what was going on in your own life, um, you'd find that it wasn't just your own fault or your own unique set of problems, but rather there were lots of other women or lots of other men in similar situations to you. And so the personal becomes political means that once you talk about your individual context and get a sense of how it's shared, your attention is turned to social and contextual varies, variables that influence your individual behavior. So for all of these reasons, a cross-sector focus might offer new insights into the process of socially constructing gender. So you can see where I'm going on the macro level with this kind of stuff. Um, I'd like to talk about an idea that comes not from gender, but from race. Because when I heard this, I, it was like, you know how, aha, when somebody gives a talk and you really learn something you, you, you thought you should have known, but you didn't know. There is a man named Wakant, and he is a sociologist who in the Department of Criminology at Berkeley. And how I ended up at his talk, you don't need to know. But he said that basically the way he tells the history of race relations in the United States is that um, as soon as one institution arises to support inequality, and history changes things, and that institution begins to fail, another institution arises to support inequality. So that inequality stays constant, but the reasons it's existing are changing. And they're changing across sectors. So in a brief history of race relations in the United States, he tells the story in terms of the first institution or sector being the institution of slavery. And when slavery was declared in, un, illegal in the Civil War times, that what happened after that was the Jim Crow laws. And they stayed in effect for a very, very long time. And it's within our lifetimes that we saw the Jim Crow laws declared illegal. And what's happened is there's still racial inequalities all over the United States. But the supporting mechanism has changed now. And it's welfare laws that keep women with children on welfare combined with the very high percentage of young African-American males that are in the prison system. And so you've got a dual set of institutions now. And his basic point is inequality is constant, but the institutional sector supports for it change over time. I thought that that was a very good idea. And I wondered if I could apply it to gender inequality. But I only have cross-sectional data at one point in time. So I'm profoundly changing his idea, but I needed to give credit for where it came from. Um, and the idea that I'm going to be talking about is the idea of sector interlocks. Gender equity interventions, that is planned change programs, focus usually on a single target organization or a single sector. So 
they might focus, for example, on, on the family and work on daycare problems. You might work on school systems and getting uh, girls and women into technical or scientific courses they might not otherwise get into. Um, so, f and in work settings, what you might do is monitor the pay levels of men and women within s similar jobs to see if there's equality present. And that's the general way people approach the study of reducing gender inequality. What I want to do in this study is really something quite different. I want to move up a level of analysis and examine how plan change in one sector affects behavior in adjacent sectors. So my basic hypothesis is up here in yellow, and it says that when one sector initiates an intervention supporting gender e equality, the spread of the planned change will be inhibited by resistance from other sectors. So I'm going to be studying across sectors. At the same time, I'm going to be looking really at the micro level of analysis and what people do, say, think, and feel in their everyday interactions with each other. Um, so to, to underline the difference, Kant is talking about sector, sector substitutions. Slavery for Jim Crow, Jim Crow for welfare and jail, um, that are longitudinal. So he's acting like a historian and he's a race scholar. What I'm doing is I'm talking about sector interlocks at a single point in time, and I'll be focusing on gender. Now, I needed a massive change program to study, and I wanted one that was global in its reach and multi-million dollars in its budget size. So I found the networking academies, which are sponsored by Cisco Systems. Um, their intervention has a single sector focus, so this is a classic single sector intervention. Their idea is to make technical training in community colleges and high schools available. So they provide an English language curriculum and they provide the hardware. And they also track enrollments, graduations, and they monitor problems on site, but the training itself is delivered by pre-existing faculty members, mostly in community colleges. Now, the global massive scope of this is just really impressive. At the time we were studying them, they had 10,000 networking academies in over 150 countries, that's good so far, but what you really need to know is these networking academies were located in poor rural areas, barrios of inner cities. They were making technical training available to people who would not otherwise have been able to obtain any access to it whatsoever. Now they needed somebody really good, strong, and impressive to lead a program of this size, and they went to a woman at Cisco and she refused to take the job unless they would have a gender initiative where in each and every country, in all 10,000 academies, they would make, fund, and monitor a concerted effort to make sure that women entered the training programs, graduated the training programs. So they had a gender initiative in 150 different countries holding constant the content of the training, which is given to you online. So it's a little bit like a controlled experiment, and you can study every single separate country and see what it is about gender inequality in that country that is particularly difficult to change. So we have, for the first time, what gender research has long been missing, which is a chance to really do tightly controlled international research. Dandy. Not as easy as it turns out, though. <laughs> First of all, I want to acknowledge that Cisco has, this is not philanthropy purely, right? They have dual goals here. They're training people to learn how to use their routing material, right at routing hardware, and that it will increase the sales of computers and therefore their networking equipment in all kinds of countries that so far have not been particularly um, affected by the computer revolution, although it's important to know that some of these 150 countries are highly industrialized. So um, which of the 150 countries do we study first? And what we did is we chose Mexico, and the reason for it was to study a contradiction. And um, to save time, I probably won't go into this too much, but I have quotes if you want to hear about it more. 
Uh, what puzzled us was that Mexico has a traditional reputation for machismo, that is very traditional gender relations, um, with overt male dominance over women. At the same time, there is considerable gender inequality that have been, has been documented in Mexico, just like you'd expect from machismo, in a wide variety of different situations. So here we have a macho country, and what happens? The networking academies in Mexico draw more women. Those women get better grades, and they graduate more often than women in all kinds of other countries, including countries like Finland. So what is it that Mexico is doing right? We picked two sites that were relatively, you know, typical of the academies. So they're drawing on a lower middle class population, and they're located, like most of the academies in Mexico, in the central region of Mexico. We picked one small city and one small town, and the small town in particular drew on the rural areas surrounding it. Um, so these are not wealthy students. And then we had the question of how many sectors can we study in a single study? So we didn't just go in and study what went on in the classroom. We studied what went on when the students went home to mom, dad, the uncles, and the grandparents, the childhood families. And within the community colleges, we not only studied what went on in the classrooms and the libraries, but we followed the students out afterwards to parties, lunches, and soccer games and basketball games and private tete-a-tetes. So um, that was, I think, the social side of school, which I think when we talk about gender inequality is crucially important. These people are 19, 20, 21 years of age, and um, in addition to studying their post-graduation employment, which in this particular sample of students is <laughs> anticipated, but we can study what the class before them got, so we have a good sense of what, what's out there for them. And then um, our last category is labeled out, their own family, their anticipated family. What this means is we knew everything about their love relationships and the kinds of relationships they had with their boyfriends, how serious they were, whether or not they already had children, and what kind of um, you know, division of labor they anticipated having in their future lives. So these are really four different sectors. Um, very different aspects of their lives. Our co-author division of labor, this was not perfect um, because I had a heavy teaching load and my research assistant was dying to go to Mexico. So we split things up. We spent a year doing the literature review and planning and getting Cisco's cooperation. And then Mandy went to Mexico. She spent one month getting training in a language institute located very close to our two sites so that she was fluent in the dialect that they spoke there and wasn't speaking schoolgirl Spanish, but she could actually pick up the quick give and take of casual conversation. Then she went to do on-site data collection and she spent one month at either site. Um, she was deeply encouraged to do mostly observation and not interviews, but she's a very chatty, sociable soul and I think <laughs> There were a lot more interviewing going on than I thought was ideal. But when she got through the day, before she went to sleep, for three months, this woman did field <coughs> notes. And she typed them into the computer and sent them to me. And then while she was sleeping, I would be reading her field notes, and I'd give her lengthy feedback on both methodology and what she found and what to follow up on. So we had a daily conversation in writing which is a very interesting uh, way to have commentary on field notes that's all written down. Uh, then in terms of data analysis, we started out, I'm trained in content analysis, and we started coding every single intervention as equal, unequal, traditional, untraditional, traditional for women, untraditional for men. We had more categories. Our coding manual is a half inch thick, and we totally failed. Our reliability was up to 95% when we decided we had failed. We could code things exactly the same way, but the fact of the matter is that almost every bit of data we had was open to multiple contradictory interpretations. Was that really traditional? Or if you look deeper, was it maybe pushing towards something more progressive than that, and vice versa? So you'll get a flavor of that in the data, but we ended up not using our coding system. And um, 
the theoretical framing we're using with this micro macro kinds of stuff, that's primarily my fault, and our writing is in progress. And at this point, I'm not sure <coughs> who's going to take the lead on that. Um, we used all these various kinds of qualitative methods. These are the standard ones. Um, observation was our first emphasis, and unstructured conversations, um, where Mandy was in the process of being trained not to ever take the lead you know, to be responsive but not leading, which in a gender study is particularly important. At the same time, we were honest that we were interested <coughs> in the women students and how they were doing. So um, we would talk to the men as well, and so it was, you know, equal time with both groups, but they knew that we were interested particularly in the women students. Uh, we had some quantitative records, which we did use as many as we ha could do, but the numbers um, were casually collected, casually analyzed, and not accurate. So um, the only thing I'm sure of is who registered for courses and what grades they got um, and who graduated. So those are the main things we focused on here. Um, this is the place where I have some quotes that I'm not going to read to you, but um, I would be glad to in the question and answer time if you're interested. This really has to do with discourse analysis. How many of you are interested in discourse analysis at the macro societal level? It's not something you do. Okay, so we might want to follow up privately. Um, there's a liberal equal opportunity rhetoric in the United States, and it's really reflected in all the language that comes from Cisco about giving women opportunity to have the same kind of training as men and get the same kinds of economic uh, payoffs from their jobs. Uh, then there's the traditional Mexican gender ideology. This is uh, what's called machismo, and it emphasizes the separation of the public domain, which is dominated by the masculine ideology or discourse, and the private domain, which is the territory of the feminine. And there are explicit re references to male superiority and male strength. Now, that's the official old-fashioned story, but both in the academic literature and in everyday talk, <coughs> gender ideology in Mexico has already changed a lot. And there is a lot of anti-machismo rhetoric going around that um, really deserves to be acknowledged here because you're going to see it in some of the quotes that I'll give you from our subjects. And so the result is that in any sector we studied, we found advocates of traditional gender ideology, advocates who were in the process of changing their gender ideology and were full of contradictions, and then people who were advocating not radical but liberal gender ideology in a very, un, you know, very matter-of-fact way. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the sectors and just give you a little taste of what the data look like. Um, so we have in the childhood families, how do we get this data? Well, we follow a student home for the weekend because there's a wedding and a party and they meet the family and they hear the kind of talk that people do when they're visiting their parents. And the main theme that we found was pressures on women students not to go to school, to get married, and to take care of home and family. And so a sample quote is one female student who described an uncle in her family who forbade his daughter to go to school and lectured this particular student, his niece, at family functions about how she should be getting married and taking care of the home. And so we'd find that kind of quote in the, in the field notes at night. Um, the second thing was this rather unanticipated aspect of the study. If fathers do allow their daughters to attend college-level school, they often don't want to invest a, invest a lot of money in their daughter's education. So two-year colleges, community colleges, are a very attractive option. The male head of department of one of the networking academies, for example, reported, quote, if fathers allow their daughters to attend school, the expectation is the daughters don't screw up and they only study subjects which will land them a well-paying job. In this way, traditional family pressures make technical majors attractive to women as well as giving them an incentive to get good grades. So you, you can see here we've got a mixture of you know, traditional and, and more progressive kinds of pressures. Now let's move over and talk about what goes on in the classroom. Women get higher grades than male students in the technical subjects, 
And they also do in the more subjective ratings of their ability to work well in a team and even to lead a team. So the women are acing their classes. Um, instructors, who are almost completely a male group, assign internships for summer work to students on the basis of their grades. So the s women students are getting the very best internships. They are completing those internships, and they are doing wonderfully at those internships. Then they go back to school for their second year of classes. So we have here what I would say in summary of all of our data. The classroom is really pretty good at being a meritocratic, equal opportunity environment for the women students. However, some of the men tell sexual jokes that embarrass the women, and they do so deliberately. And when they're walking around looking at people working on the computer, they're quite often likely to go up to the woman when she's working and massage her shoulders, up her neck, down the side of her arms. And this is much more likely to happen to the attractive students than it is to the unattractive students. Male students sometimes get patted on the back, but most of the commentary and touching is actually on the screen itself. So, you know, you have this is ambiguity or ambivalence in the sense that they tried to tell us that this flirtation was a social norm and that it expressed appreciation for the women rather than any form of what we would call sexual harassment. And we heard this from the women and from the men and from the teachers as well as the students. So I just give you the data and you can decide what it is that we saw. <laughs> Number three up here. When asked why all the women were working on one side of the room, so there were computers down this side of the room and that side of the room, and if you come in and look at the class, the men are all over here, three persons to a computer, and the women are all over here. So we noticed this and we asked. And uh, a female student said, well, quote, some men don't have respect, which makes coexistence difficult. And I picked that quote because it was very typical of the women's deliberate choice to segregate themselves so they could get work done and not have all the guys fooling around with them all the time. So that's that. Social relations were fascinating. So they leave this meritocratic equal opportunity but sex segregated classroom with male teachers and they go outside and their two favorite games are basketball and soccer. And having been cooped up in the classroom, they want to go out and get some exercise. Well, why is basketball so popular? The women are clearly disadvantaged by their height and the fact that they don't play basketball in lower level schools very often. And so they pick co-ed teams, but those teams are dominated by the males. And the women are just kind of, you know, kind of standing back around the edges and every once in a while someone throws them the ball. Well, soccer you think would be more equal because soccer is very popular among women and men in Mexico. And they again picked um, co-ed teams. But one of the women in the class, we found out, was a professional soccer player. So we thought, this is interesting. She's going down to the soccer field. We watch her. She's benched. And she isn't just benched on Monday and Tuesday. She's benched all the time. She isn't allowed to play. Why? Because that would make the teams unequal. So the only women that are allowed to play are inferior players. And when they get a really good female player, no way. And you also see some signs of ambivalence about uh, equality in the love relationships. Um, this comes from the female school psychologist. She estimated that 30 to 40 percent of the female students are financially supported by their boyfriends. Pay, the boyfriends are paying the tuition. This isn't just living expenses. And the male student boyfriends often feel uncomfortable when the girlfriends get better grades. And when that happens, they may withdraw support and encourage a lack of studying. So within the love relationships, if the woman's grades get too good, it's the boyfriend who's paying her bills, who's encouraging her to ease up a bit and stop being such a dork and maybe get grades as low as his. Um, and so this is a good example of, remember I told you we didn't know how to code anything? You know, the boyfriend supporting the girlfriend by paying her tuition. Equality, but then when she gets better grades, he's threatening to take the, the, the support away. So it's also a way of exhibiting control over her. And so it, we found that that, like a whole lot of other things that we collected in terms of data, is very hard to interpret whether this is progressive or traditional. 
Um, another example is this woman, <coughs> female student. She proudly described how her boyfriend supports her in her studies. Quote, he drives me everywhere. If I have a meeting, he'll drive me there and wait for me until I'm done, no matter how long. Woo! And so um, that's another one where you could say either he's being supportive and, and driving her everywhere, or he's watching over her very carefully in kind of a paternalistic way. And again, you really don't know. Uh, anticipated employment, gender inequality is, is um, pervasive in employment situations. So the women get, understand, these women have straight A's, they have the best summer internships, and they don't get job offers. And when they do get job offers, it's at much lower pay than the men from the class who got poorer grades. Um, and part of the reasoning for this is that females with better jobs than men are seen as even more threatening than women who have better grades than men. So let me give you a quote on this, because this is crucially important given the purpose of the training. One female student said, quote, if a woman earns more than a man or a woman is in a position of authority at work, it is an issue of pride for the men and it looks bad, end quote. She explained that while it's not a problem for women to do better in school from her point of view, she thought women achieving more than men in jobs after graduation was seen as a serious problem because it had monetary consequences. So for example, um, there's also inequality <laughs> due to the childhood families. The daughters who graduate are encouraged to come home to their vi rural village and take care of their parents. And so the only job open to them in that rural village is to bring the first computer into that village through something like an internet cafe. Um, the, 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 the women that go home just have no job opportunities whatsoever to use the training they've been given and have done so well in. And yet there's still some evidence of growing equality. The instructors recommend the women highly. We checked the written records of their recommendations and they were singing the praises of these women. So this didn't come from the teachers. And the graduates who, rep who report discomfort with having female coworkers also reported to us that that discomfort seldom lasted more than six months. And then if you talk to graduates who'd actually gotten corporate jobs and worked together for more than a year, they were working together quite effectively and most signs of tension, according to them, had disappeared. Take that with a grain of salt or not, but they certainly, when we met them, seemed comfortable with each other. Um, and then finally, anticipated families, and this is perhaps the most important sector of all, they had very traditional gender relationships. The man gets the car, the woman gets the care of the child, even though the woman is working full time. Just one example, but these people are organizing their lives in a very traditional way. But there were a few women, usually in dual career marriages, who believe that work-family balance is possible and they think it depends on the character of the individual woman. So you as an individual could succeed and have both a job and a husband if you're the right kind of woman. Um, and so uh, I guess I just raised the question, is this a male issue as well? And how much can one individual woman or even one couple do if societal norms, employment practices are not supportive? Does an individual woman taking responsibility for achieving work-family balance all by herself, ironically, make societal level changes more less likely? So here's a picture. It's a completely illegitimate picture because this is a qualitative study and I can't give you counts. But the basic point of it is this is the school where the intervention took place and as you can see, in the classroom, it was really quite equal. The blue was quite high. And peer relations outside of the classroom, for example, at parties and dances and sports, were, were real so strong signs of inequality. Those strong signs of inequality were even more intense when we talked about the kinds of jobs that were open to the women after graduation. And the greatest inequality was found in their love relationships with the men they were planning to marry, or had actually married. Childhood families were also quite in it, unequal, but the chance of the women having a good income oftentimes would create some change from traditional relationships in the childhood families. So on the micro level, we have a process of socially constructing gender that showed a contested terrain 
with pressures for and against changed gender relations with a lot of ambiguity and ambivalence. Uh, on the macro level, we have support for the cross-sector interlock hypothesis, a planned intervention in one sector, gender equal technical training in schools, had limited effects <laughs> due to the lack of change in the adjacent sectors such as childhood families and employing or organizations, as well as peer social relationships and romantic relationships. What can be done then to cr combat cross-sector resistance to plan change? I'd like to look for ideas at the micro level and then talk a little bit about the process of socially constructing gender. So in the conclusion section of this, I want to go a little bit beyond my data and talk more generally about what can be done. Uh, first of all, say we could redesign the Cisco intervention, how would we do it? If we took a cross-sectional approach, we would certainly do modifications in the schoolrooms. But we might monitor and seek to change informal and unequal classroom dynamics. Some of the teachers, for example, created mixed sex groups around the computers rather than having the women work on one side of the room. Uh, and in doing that, whether that was a good thing to do or not, it can be debated, but they were trying to kind of mix up and be conscious of the sexual relations of people within the classroom. We could also facilitate more equal informal peer social relations. So there might be ways, for example, to discourage basketball and encourage sports that both genders were good at and having fairer ways of picking teams and picking leaders of teams. It's in interfering with people's social time, but it's mm -hmm. also a way of, of kind of acknowledging the fact that the social relationships at school are crucial if you're trying to work with gender inequality. Modifications and employment opportunities, you can facilitate job opportunities for women in nearby corporations. And Cisco, in fact, had done that. Um, so they'd gone to IBM and other competing organizations and asked them to make opportunities available for the women and said that they, too, were doing it, and they, too, in fact, were doing it. And then this is one they didn't do, but I wish they had. Since so many of the women were not ever going to be able to be hired by a corporation, why not offer training for how to be an entrepreneur? And why not make available microloans? You know what those are? Tiny amounts of money uh, that have been shown to really, really provide enough capital in an un underdeveloped context to have women be able to start small businesses. Uh, and this would help particularly the women that had to return to their childhood family villages. Um, the problems with the, the, this approach, just now talking about a cross-sector approach to Cisco, is just working on the classroom alone costs Cisco millions of dollars each year. Can you imagine the increased cost if they did all the things in yellow that I'm suggesting up here? It just gets to be a fantastically expensive interact intervention, and it's being funded out of the profits of a company. And so unlike a government level intervention, this is problematic. Also, childhood and anticipated family and gender dynamics are unchanged by all the recommendations I've got up here because of privacy concerns and just what kind of changes can you legislate within a family and how would you go about doing it are interesting questions we can talk about. I have some ideas, but they're controversial. Um, this is a cross-sector approach to change. This is an example of a union getting daycare funding in New York City by getting the Catholic Church to force the Catholic hospitals to subsidize daycare. And then what happened was the other non-Catholic hospitals had to offer the same kinds of daycare in order to compete for workers. So it's a cross-sector gender-related uh, example. Why is gender re reducing gender inequality so difficult? <clears throat> because cross-sector interlocks inhibit plan change in one sector from spilling over into other sectors, slowing the change process. Planning gender equality interventions that cross sector boundaries may be likely to have more impact, but also to be realistic, the cost will be prohibitive. And there's a great deal of difficulty in affecting gender relations in families. So the New York Union example we had a lot of support for these conclusions that also are supported in the Mexican data. And then beyond that, talking about um, plan change and the reduction of gender inequality more broadly, I think we need to anticipate problems like the two I just raised about intervening in families and the prohibitive cost. 
On the micro level, I think we need to focus on socially constructed aspects of sex and gender in everyday life. In the weddings, in the dances, in the soccer fields, in the basketball fields, in the massages, uh, in the classroom, and in the talk between family members. We need to seek out ambiguities and contradictions and ask where exactly is the resistance for change coming from? How does it surface? And what changes might reduce this resistance to change? So I think if we're trying to work on gender inequality and reducing it, going all the way down to the micro level and studying the conversations the way we did really gives you a much better handle on exactly what's going wrong when you get the resistance to the change. And then on the macro level, I think it's very important that we design interventions that cross sector boundaries and assess the effects of the change effort in the adjacent sectors. So don't just change it in an organization and then study the effects in that organization. Um, in this case, the organization was the school system and you really have to study the families and the employing organizations, et cetera, in assessing the effect of the change in adjacent sectors. That is the end. We've got 10 minutes for questions and I'd love to hear what you say. I know some of you have to leave, so it's fine. Sarah? Hi. Um, Hi, Sarah. Thanks very much for that presentation. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, when you were looking at um, interlocking sectors, and I think that that's, I agree with you, I think that that's the way to go when trying to think about how to change the social construction of gender and how to raise the social value, really, of femininity um, or feminine-based um, organization. Right. Um, I also think that it's really difficult because the boundaries between those sectors are quite porous. So it's not, I, I don't, I'm not even sure I would think of them as interlocking as much as kind of permeable across, you know, because so, you know, because they affect each other. That's so what I meant by interlocking, so maybe I've got the wrong word. Well, in any case, yeah. my, my question was, ha, did you also consider as one of those uh, sectors um, the media as a realm in which these processes of social, con the social construction of gender is both sustained, created and sustained? In this particular context, the media hadn't picked up on the, the particular program we were studying, and so I'm not sure that it had that big effect, but I think in another country, you study the, um, the, the, the networking academies, you'd find a very different set of interlocking institutions. I think some would be the same, like family. And the other ones that would be relevant, that have been suggested to us, are medical care and the role of religion. Certainly in the Middle East, for example, the role of religion is quite different than in Italy, um, Catholic Church. And so um, those, I think you're absolutely right. The institutions change and a broader sector would be important. Also, the other way in which the media come into this study that I didn't talk about very much was the discourse analysis at the societal level because that's very definitely, my quotes, some of them come from uh, academic literature, but some of them are affected on a societal level by the media coverage. Um, and so that's been a real factor, particularly in Mexico City in the newspapers. Well, that kind of leads me to my second question, which is that I think that it's abs you're absolutely right that when you kind of deal with the official, especially I'm thinking of the U.S., and the liberal rhetoric of things like rights and mm -hmm. consenting and all, you know, when you have a definition of consent that is already based on inequality, it's very difficult to, you know, implement change <coughs> using that kind of liberal rhetoric. So I'm wondering if you could share with us your controversial suggestion. Change. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the ones I thought the most about is how do you muck with the family and get away with it. And um, I actually try this with my MBAs uh, in a t course that I teach. And so I get a series of speakers come in who handle work family things differently. And they all have a successful woman MBA in the family who's got kids. Um, but in some cases, she stays home and plans to go back to work. Other times, she's a part-timer. Other times, they have seven or eight nannies and a very extended, expensive support system. And in other cases, they have traditional extended family support systems. And what I do is I get each, each of those very different models to have a day. And then I put them all together in a panel and have them argue with each other 
about which way is best and which way would work for me, and the students get to ask questions. And then they get to pick one of them and go for a small lunch where they can ask in private the questions they have. And then I have a section where everybody brings either their significant other or a good friend. And then they go through a class as a couple. And so that's my way of working on the anticipated families and exposing them to a variety of different ways of doing it. Um, and get each case, the person who chose that way is a wonderful example of it. You know, articulate, fun, proud. And so that's an example of how to muck with families, which is normally a very private realm in this country, and begin to open people's minds. Um, but it took a long time to get the, through the deans. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next question. Hi. Um, one of the, this is very fascinating, uh, but it, it's apparent that there's a lot of dynamic uh, operating in here. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, when I say um, in reason, one age of dynamic is uh, wanting to encourage your young to explore and to grow, but at the same time, at some point, reaching it, sometimes they're quickly reaching a threshold of uh, threat. Mm -hmm. So math modeling simulation. Cool. Do it. <laughs> I think that would be wonderful. Um, I really do. Uh, I think that this kind of, you know, for an organizational scholar to go in and study, you know, families and schools and, you know, all these different kinds of organizations in a single <coughs> study is, is highly unusual. And the more varied methods we can bring to bear on this, the better. And also, as a cynic, I think that gender research that's qualitative isn't as credible to the lovers of quantitative research. And so having quantitative researchers come in, take some of these ideas, and see where they could go with it using the, a different methodology would be great. So you started with the question of why Mexico? Why, what's happening in Mexico that's going mm -hmm. on here? Yeah, that was one explanation. I, I, you're right, my slides did leave out the answer to that question. The other one is that even in very traditional poor rural families, if you have one of your children who could get a great income through technical training, they're willing to put aside their traditional ideology and let her get, get, give this a try. And, and it also then fits in with the other belief systems about you know, women trying to support the family position, in other words, the support the whole family and that's okay with this compatible with this role. And so, so that's a, that's a different variation than in. It is. I think what I would add when you're thinking about this, I can see how you're, you're, you're beginning to build your model. Um, but one of the assumptions that's a fatal assumption that they haven't thought about is if the woman goes to work and has a good income, she can't possibly take care of her parents, prepare the food for all the family celebrations, and do all the housework and the childcare. And so build in there, you know, some kind of a model of who does what at home. As in, in, and, and there'll be different answers to that. I mean, some of the dual career families are really every bit as progressive as anything I've seen in Silicon Valley. And others are very traditional. And the woman is just beginning to understand that as soon as she has the fourth child, keeping the job is going to be tough. And the husband's unwilling. So I think. You know, build in time use at home as a way of measuring the family piece of this. And then you'll really be able to tap into quite a bit. And you can do that with, like, they have data on time diaries. So you've gotten men and women to talk about how many hours they spend doing various kinds of things. So, yes? How was this sort of reaction uh, the response to your findings in your study? Um, well, they said, you know, we've already thought about that. And we've already gone to IBM and gotten them to hire our graduates in Nairobi. And we've already gone to, you know. So they were a little defensive about 
the fact that these people weren't getting jobs. And they also said that any country where Cisco was present, which is not all that many, that they were hiring the women. So that was one kind of response that they gave us. Then they, they, they got the idea about entrepreneurial and microloans. Oh, well that they hadn't thought of. And so we actually worked with them to kind of get them access to online entrepreneurial training that was available and to put them in touch with a bunch of people doing microloans that were interested in developing those microloans in particular areas of the world. So they now have um, kind of experiments and test cases going. Um, the other example was that they understood a lot more than we, than we thought they did about um, the family pressures. And so they gave the example of an AIDS-ridden region of Africa where they had been unable to get students to come to the technical training until they provided dorms. And in order for the parents to feel like they were safe in sending their children, they had to have a male dorm and a female dorm with locked doors after 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And good fire protection and somebody there to open the doors if you know, they needed to get out, which was, you know, they had to build the buildings, hire the guards, block, and then convince the parents. And they had done that. And the, that particular academy was doing quite, quite well. And there had been no incidences of AIDS being spread. And so th that was another example of how they were ahead of us, academics. And they had already anticipated the cross-sector argument and that they were trying to get more money for Cisco to pay for this. I said, how's that going? <laughs> and it turned out this was tough times for Cisco that year and they weren't doing too well on it. So Cisco couldn't see the payoff quite as directly because, you know, once the graduate is graduated, if they're not using Cisco products or working for Cisco, they're helping their competitors. And so this division of the company um, begins to push the limits of what the company is willing to do for philanthropy. And it's particularly in the cross-sector aspects of my argument that the company is unwilling to fund it, but the people that run the networking academies are enthusiastic. So I highlighted a problem. <laughs>